My name is Lewis Duncan, and it's my privilege to serve as the 14th president of Rollins College. And before, yeah. Well, if you think that's impressive, I'm pleased to recognize that with us this evening is my immediate predecessor, the 13th president of Rollins College, Rita Bornstein. And her immediate predecessor, the 12th president of Rollins College, Thaddeus Seymour. And if you do the math, uh, collectively among us, we represent uh, 30, 38 years of Rollins history, uh, of Rollins 128 years of its history. So um, well more than a quarter of the history of Rollins is, is embodied in the presidents who are with us right now. So it's a, it's a great pleasure. And they remember the Langford, so I could, <laughs> before my time. Well, uh, I want to welcome you to what is a very special evening here at the Alfond Inn at Rollins. Uh, tonight we celebrate what is uh, to be a dialogue of uh, ideas, actually uh, embodying the, the, and defining the, the sense of, of a truly fulfilling education, uh, re rewarding us with uh, sharing of observations and reflections and challenging us uh, with the discovery of content and uh, uh, connections and ultimately meanings. Uh, we're invited to undertake a, a visual journey, a one that uh, asks us to step outside of our traditional uh, frame of reference and frame of thought uh, and to explore uh, beyond the boundaries of our routine readings on the physical world around us. Uh, what better place? Who, what institution is better poised uh, to expand our senses and our perceptions uh, than a liberal arts college, a college of liberal arts and sciences, I would add? Uh, what institution is better poised, in fact, uh, to explore the expressions of the current generation of artists uh, as, uh, as they express themselves through their art than an institution of learning that champions uh, the commitment to educating students for global citizenship and responsible leadership in the 21st century. So Rollins is exceedingly proud uh, to be the home for this collection. Uh, we are honored and indeed awed at the arrival of the Alphonse Collection of Contemporary Art at Rollins. And uh, I'd like you to join me in showing our appreciation and thanks to the architects of this magnificent collection and our host this evening, Barbara and Ted Alphonse. <laughs> From all of us at Rollins and in, indeed the, the whole community, we thank you for your, for your vision and generosity. And now to continue this dialogue of ideas, I'm pleased to introduce the Bruce A. Beale Director of Rollins College's Cornell Fine Arts Museum, Dr. Anna Heller. Dr. Heller joined us uh, a little over a year ago after having served for eight years as the founding executive director of another great learning museum, uh, New York's Museum of Biblical Art. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Anna Heller. Thank you I, and welcome. Um, I am so excited to see so many of you tonight as we celebrate the uh, official um, coming out of the, uh, of the collection. Um, Earlier this week, I was at a conference of the American Alliance of Museums in Savannah, Georgia, and one of the, uh, at one of the sessions I attended, the question that was posed was, what can our museums do to stay relevant today and in the future? And um, one of the answers that most participants agreed on was the fact that we need to in incorporate new audiences and to put our collections out to make them accessible, available, and um, to have them interact with an ever wider audience um, as much as possible. And as I heard that, I, I started thinking about the Alphonse Collection of Contemporary Art um, and 
the way it is displayed here in a, in a hotel, in a public place. And I said, wait a minute, this is the new frontier and we're pushing it. And um, so the, the notion of having art of this caliber in, in, in this public place is really literally and metaphorically pushing the boundaries of our museum and the boundaries of our campus out and sharing it not only in a new place, but I think in a new way. Um, so to have the, now there are other hotels that have art and, and quite good and interesting art on display as part of their brand personality and persona. But to my knowledge, this is the only instance where a teaching museum's collection has gone out of its shell, of the museum shell, and is shared, a collection, I like to call it a collection with a point of view, and is shared in a public way with people in a hotel that adjoins our campus and our museum. So for that, as President Duncan mentioned, we need to thank the uh, forward-thinking generosity and the vision uh, of uh, Barbara and Ted Alphonse. So thank you for, for giving me, us at the museum, this, uh, this amazing gift. And, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me. There are a number of other people who have contributed to creating this, this amazing collection and that I would love to thank and acknowledge tonight. First and foremost, uh, I do need to acknowledge Barbara's partner in, cr in crime, um, Abigail Goodman, Ross Goodman, who is here with us tonight. Abby provided the curatorial voice, and I should say the curatorial force, behind, behind this collection. And um, it is her nuanced knowledge of contemporary art and her very keen understanding of Barbara's original vision that have contributed to bringing together this, uh, this very uh, cohesive, curatorially cogent, and frankly, extraordinarily exciting collection. And so as the uh, very happy, to the point of being slightly giddy and I had nothing to drink, a recipient and very thankful recipient of this collection, I want to thank you, Abigail, and you, Barbara, from the bottom of my heart. Now, from the 55 artists who are represented in this collection, we are lucky that we have four of them with us tonight. And uh, other than our featured speaker, who I will introduce in just a second, we have here uh, Barnett Gideon. I, and I, I reverse your names, I'm sorry. Gideon Barnett from Miami. We have Aitan Shapira here, there you go. And I think we have Juan Travieso, who I didn't get to meet earlier. Oh, he didn't make it. Okay, so that's, we have the two, and then we have Tim Rollins, who I will get to introduce. So thank you so much for coming to share this special evening with us, and I hope everybody will go and check out Gideon's and Aitan's work on the second, third floor and on in the dining room, in the restaurant. And also we have a number of representatives from the galleries who have, who represent some of these amazing artists and who have helped us uh, with uh, obtaining this work. So I would like to acknowledge um, Ian and Warren Adelson from the Adelson Galleries. Okay, well, you know, I, not everybody made it. I, oh, there you are. Excellent. Thank you very much. Alexander Gray is here from Alexander Gray Gallery. Paula Naughton from the Simon Preston Gallery. Is Paula here? No. Um, Alex, yes, we acknowledge Alex. And uh, Laura Pinello from the James Cohen Gallery. There you are. Thank you. And, and finally, before I move on, uh, I would like to acknowledge my colleague and friend, uh, Sharon Corwin from the Colby Art Museum. Uh, who came all the way from Maine for this evening. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, the artist Haume Plenza, whose sculpture uh, you could see just outside of the uh, doors of the conservatory where we had our cocktail hour, um, once said um, after his work uh, Echo was installed in Madison Square Park in New York City in 2011, he was quoted to say, once the installation was done, to say, and now the conversation starts. 
So um, let us turn to a conversation uh, that I think will be on very similar terms tonight. And since the Alphand collection, as, as President Duncan mentioned, was conceived specifically as a teaching collection, a collection that embodies and, and at the same time conveys the, those liberal arts values that were so dear to Barbara and Ted when they were students at Rawlings and, and ever since. I think it should come as no surprise that we have chosen as our speaker tonight an artist who's made, who's put teaching, um, made teaching the cornerstone of his practice and um, who uh, has managed to, I think, revolutionize, and I'm sorry Tim, I'm using big words, but it's what I think, the relationship between art literacy and creativity and critical thinking in a way that I think has come as a, as a very unexpected surprise to a lot of us in the art world and, and in the critical world as well. Uh, Tim Rollins is with us tonight. He is based in New York City. Um, he has a degree from the University of Maine at Augusta and then an MFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York City where he got to study with Joseph Kosuth whose work uh, welcomed you as you came through the doors of the hotel here. So I think it's, it was all planned. It was all planned from day one. Um, and, and, and Tim, in 1979, he co-founded the Artist Collaborative Group Material, um, of which he remained an active member and exhibited with until 87. Um, but then, really, the, the pivotal moment, I think, in Tim's career was 1981, when he started teaching at the Intermediate School number. 52 in the South Bronx, um, and um, since 1982, all his exhibited work has been the result of a collaboration with his students there and, um, and later uh, in, in different settings. And what started as uh, a group exhibiting under the name of Tim Rollins as and 15 kids from the South Bronx, or then became 20 kids from the South Bronx and Tim Rollins, in 1985 became known as Tim Rollins and Kids of Survival, KOS. And uh, the name was actually chosen. There was a $20 contest, and the kids had to come up with the best name they could. And Kids of Survival was uh, chosen and has, has stayed with us. So for more than 30 years now, Tim has made incredible art and has made history, really, um, simply because when he started teaching at, at IS-52, he refused to write these kids off the way that his other teachers had and the way that really, frankly, our entire educational system had. Um, but he refused to do that, and he will tell you something about his amazing journey with his kids now, some of whom are adults and have careers on, uh, on their own. Some of them continue to, to work with him. What I want to say before I pass the mic on to him is that in the 30 years, um, they've come a very long way. And from the first exhibition they had at Hostos College, a community college in the Bronx, uh, they've been part of the Whitney Biennial twice, the Venice Biennale, Documenta at Castle. Uh, and from the first work that they sold for $5,000 to Chase Manhattan Bank, when one of the kids was famously quoted to say, and pardon my French, damn, white folk would buy anything, let's make some more. <laughs> to, to, so from there to being now in more than 95 collections, museums and public co collections, among which the Whitney Museum of American Art, MoMA, Tate Modern, and of course, most recently and most importantly, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. So today we are very fortunate to have Tim Rollins with us, and please help me welcome him at Rollins at the Alphonse Inn at the Cornell. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Yo, know, back at me. I'm Congregationalist Baptist Pentecostal. You better talk back to me. <laughs> I said, all right, I saw that, all right. <laughs> uh, President Duncan, uh, nice place you got here. <laughs> and I just have one question for everybody in the room tonight. Just one. Is anyone here excited to be here? Could you give it back to me? I came here for a party. 
<laughs> and this is how I roll. Okay. You know, it's very surreal to walk around a campus and you see your name everywhere on tote bags, <laughs> T-shirts, <laughs> and I had nothing to do with it. But then again, hmm, hmm, 1855, bunch of Congregationalists, probably self-important New Englanders, come on down to the backwoods of Florida to teach Florida kids the New England way of education. Hmm. This guy, what, Alonzo Rollins, right? He comes on in, born in uh, Lebanon Center, Maine, not far off from where I'm from, Waterville, Maine. And uh, so he, via Chicago, comes here and decides Let's start this place called Rollins College. Let's make something that's nonconformist. Let's make something that's free thinking. Let's make something that's separated from the usual church ways, if you know what I'm talking about. Right? So here we go. I'm walking around, and I get this kind of feeling. And then I uh, walk to the Cornell, which is beautiful, and I get into the Knowles Chapel today. And I'm sitting there. And I'm hearing Emerson, who wrote that books are not to be read, they're meant to be used. And I'm hearing Thoreau, who says that I've met many a person who's read a whole lot of books, but they've never read a book meaning they haven't lived it, right? And I have Alcott and all these people, and I got so many voices in my head, I said, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm walking in this beautiful, beautiful sunny day, and I hit the Morse Museum. And I go see, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I'm ignorant, and I didn't know that you had all that Tiffany stuff over in there. <laughs> yeah, ooh. Ah, now, and I'll tell you the Tiffany story because I was just interviewed for a book and they wanted to know me coming from the backwoods of Maine what, and becoming an artist, what was my first artistic epiphany? And at first I thought maybe it was the beautiful yellow and blue Sunoco gas station sign. But we don't have any museums or galleries or anything like that. I thought it might be that, or was it the buds red and white, the big white disc and red disc that used to spin in the parking lot while I waited for mom to get groceries on a cold Friday night when paycheck came? Uh, my daddy actually worked at Dexter Shoes, which was part of your, your family. It's like, you're getting crazy, all right? <laughs> it's getting crazy. <laughs> and then I go in there, and I look at the, especially the pieces that were done for the Briggs House around 1900, all right? Now, the epiphanies, the, the, the people ask me, what was your first thing that really thought, you know, you were in the, in the presence of art? And on Pine Street, right off Main Street in my little town, Pittsfield, Maine, in the First Universalist Church, there was a window. And I used to, now I went to the First Baptist Church, but it was boring, and I used to come over to, not like the church I go to now in Harlem, hello, but, but, but now, and then I got to the Universalist Church, and there's this amazing window glowing, and, and it's Jesus, but all this crazy ass stuff happening all around him, you know, that makes no sense. And I found out recently, they didn't even, they kind of knew, but they didn't know how much it was worth. It's a Tiffany window in the middle of my little town. And they said, Tim, when you're a little boy at the age of two or three, you'd always sit in the back pew. You wouldn't listen to the preacher, and you would have, you turn around and just gaze at the window. Wow. And then I go look at those Briggs things, and I'm looking, and I go, oh my God, that looks just like our Midsummer Night's Dream works, that my mother and brother from another mother uh, the help first God for the collection, and I'm telling you right now, I'm there and I'm looking at it, and you know they play music there, right, in the background? They started, they played the overture, Mendelssohn's overture that he wrote when he was 16 years old, incidental music to a Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'm like, what is going on in here? 
anyone from the genealogy department because I am ready for my DNA swab right now. <laughs> I don't know it all, but I got a testimony. Can I tell you my story? Is that all right? Talk to me. <laughs> all right, thank you. That's all right. Now, okay. <laughs> Here we go. All right, I believe all works of art should be good total works of art. All good works of art are time machines. In other words, they, they, they conflate the past of history into the present and then into the future for future audiences. That's why what we all do is so important. Am I right about it? Especially in this day and time. Got it? Okay. All right. You, know, you look like my fifth graders. I love this, so I'm going to go off tonight. Okay. And, and, and so um, let's get in the time machine. Will you take a mental flight with me, please? Talk to me. I'm not kidding. Here we go, here we go, here we go. It is April 11th, 2001. And Rick Sauvignon, who's a little kid up there, he's like 13, the one that's acting crazy and bugging out. And he was in his late 20s, and actually he's about, he's about to turn 30. That next day, his birthday's uh, September 12th. And we're in our uh, Chelsea studio, we're in the South Bronx, and we have one in Chelsea right across from James Cohen Gallery, actually. And we're way up on the ninth floor, and we're preparing for this big exhibition. We're preparing this beautiful painting, the first version of it, and it's called The Midsummer Night's Dream. After Shakespeare made with maybe 40 different kids from the South Bronx and Harlem and then my own crew in the studio. So here we go, uh, go with me. The, the studio is like here. We have windows floor to ceiling that are looking south towards the World Trade Center. And then in the north part, a huge wall. And that's where this big, beautiful, magical first thing that we're not sure if it's good or not, which is the most exciting part of being an artist. When you don't know, then you know, huh? And so, and it happens. And we go, isn't that weird? It's on fire. And then, boom, the second thing happens. And we're like, unbelievable. I mean, you know, trying to take it in the whole afternoon. We didn't actually even want to leave. We said, let's keep working. So we're working, we're doing it, and then you keep looking. And as the, the sun came down, what the, the, if anyone was there, the, the, the t towers were like these amazing howling poltergeists, two columns of smoke. And we're looking over there, the most amazing act of destruction you can possibly imagine in my time. And then we look over onto this wall, the most beautiful, dang, innocent, joyous, buoyant. And you look over here down south, and you see death, and you look on that wall, and you see life, and I think it hit us that we knew then and there what side we were on. Anyone with me here? Can I get a witness here? We knew what side we were on, and we were determined. The next day, we said we're coming back to work, and we all came back, and we opened the window, and uh, I don't I, I, it, the aroma memory is amazing. This, this wind blew north. And the wind, it, I couldn't even get what it was. And it was faintly, you know, faintly familiar. Maybe was it back in Maine? Because in Maine back in, when I was growing up in the, in the 60s, they didn't have landfills or anything. It was not environmentally correct, like Mainers claimed they were. Back then, they had big open dumps that would burn, big, big, big ones. But I used to love to go with Daddy because visuals were amazing. It was like before special effects. It's like this giant pile of burning stuff, and it was just so strange to look at and such a break from the TV and whatever. I was like enthralled with it. I was afraid I was a pyromaniac or something. And I thought, is that the funny smell? Because it was kind of like that. I said, no, that's not it. And I'm looking, and I'm figuring, and Rick, who's pretty macho, Dominican, American, and his eyes were like moist, wet. And he goes, Tim, don't you remember? That's what our neighborhood smelt like every day when you first came. 
I was 13, 14 years old. When Angel was 11, and I go, wow. Okay, come with me again. It is almost the exact same time, and it is uh, 1981. And here I am, I'm right out of, I studied with Joseph Kasuth at SVA, John Cage. I was going to be a big art star. I come from the hills of Maine, right? Uh, I love the Colby College connection because my grandmother worked at the commissary for 40 years. And one time I visited, none of, I was the first in my whole family to go to college. And uh, what made it happen is I went to visit Grammy. Her name was Alice Rollins, and, I, and Grammy said, I want Timmy to come visit me. And I walked on the campus of Colby College, and I said, I want to be in a place like this. I want to be in a place like this. And it was done. That was it. There's no going to the factory. I wasn't going to do any of that stuff. I knew that that's what was going to happen. So that's how Colby changed my life. And so I get on literally a Greyhound bus to move into the Hotel Chelsea, <laughs> of all places, study at SVA, go to NYU to study education and, and philosophy. And I take on the sadomasochistic act of becoming a special ed junior high school teacher in the South Bronx in 1981. Oh, don't clap. And I was supposed to go, I was in this program called Learn to Read Through the Arts, and the, the, the cynical teachers called it the Getaway Day program, because on Mondays you'd be in Harlem, Tuesdays you'd be on the lower uh, east side when it was all heroines and not boutiques, okay? And then you'd be somewhere at bed -Stuy, which was before the hipsters came, for real. And then you'd be in the South Bronx on Thursdays. Fridays, they gave you the day off, so you didn't, weren't in the union, you didn't get any benefits or nothing. And like an idiot, I thought this was cool. Because coming from Maine, all my friends, you know, in New, in New York, they just dressed in all black and smoked cigarettes and never went above 14th Street. And I said, I didn't come all the way from the piney woods of Maine to not explore this amazing city. So every day, I'd be in a different place. And I loved them all, but boy, there was something about the South Bronx. Because it was like, uh, it, it, I was in this, right near the train, and, and, and I was there, and I was doing this supervising thing. It was a part-time thing. And this very dynamic Puerto Rican-American principal named George Gallego said, uh, listen, would you like to come up and check out my school? And we're having a hard time keeping art teachers. Warning, but I didn't know. We have a hard time keeping art teachers, and could you come on up? And I was very, you know, white Yankee, the missionary Baptist thing. Oh, yes, I'm the nice, magnanimous guy, and I'll come up and work with brown children for a week or two and brag about it at cocktail parties for the rest of my life and art openings. You're laughing, but you know I'm right. You know how some of us are. Sorry. If you can't say amen, say ouch. And uh, I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to do this. You know, and at that time, I was living with a rock star. And I said, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. It'll be interesting. And uh, he said, good, come to my school. And I go, how, I, I is 52 on Kelly Street in the South Bronx. I go, how do you get there? He goes, you take the number two train to Prospect Avenue. Prospect Avenue. God, that sounds so nice. Huh? Prospect Avenue. I said, I'll be there. I'll be that. And on a crisp September morning, I go on up there, and I had never been up that far, and you're underground, and then some people know you get up on the elevated, up to the Jackson Avenue, and you're on Prospect Avenue. I could not believe my eyes. Acres and acres and acres of devastation. Literally looked like the old photos of Dresden after the bomb, right? Only in that case, they deserved it. And I go, wow. You could smell that 9-11 smell before you got out of the train. And I got out, and I'm walking down Prospect Avenue to get to uh, Kelly Street. And I said in my head, thank God, I only said two weeks. Crackhead over here, abandoned buildings over here. You could hear the wind go through the buildings. They were like up, charred out, burnt out harmonicas. And they would go. <sighs> <sighs> I mean, it was like a horror movie. 
and the, the sirens over there and the fire over there and all the commotion, wild packs of wild dogs, literally. And then in all of that, you had a mom with two little kids, three kids, walking to school like this, just getting to school, making their way. And I go to the uh, school, and you could hear the school without even getting into the school. The pandemonium was so loud and crazy. I got some teachers in here because I'm getting a lot of nods, right? And I walk in, I get my, go through the security, all this or that. I go into the principal's office, Gallego, and he's there. And I walk in, everyone applauds, right? And then George goes, OK, everybody, pay up. He had, they had actually doing a pool, a betting pool, that I would not make it those three blocks to Prospect Avenue. <laughs> and I said, thank God, two weeks. He goes, Tim, we're so glad you're here. I said, thank you very much. And he goes, and guess what? We got you a room. I go, yeah. And guess what? It even has a sink. And I'm like, what's going on in here until I walk through the school? Five floors, Barbara, and the first two floors are shut down because they're in such disrepair. I get into my room, and they do have a sink, but it had no drain. President, they had a spackle bucket underneath, and the water came through. It was like a third world country. I said, two weeks. And then I'm looking around. There's no windows. They've been boarded up with plywood. And on the plywood was all this really bad graffiti and, and, and homemade magic markers. They would take, remember roll-on deodorant? They would take roll-on deodorant, fill it with ink, and then steal blackboard erasers. We're talking about creativity. And then, and, and then fold the, the, the felt into the thing and make these giant markers on their own. Right? And it was all over the walls, but especially it was fascinating because I'm looking on the ceiling. It's about almost as high. And all on that is graffiti, kind of good, in charcoal, big vine charcoal. And I go, George, how the hell, these are 13 year olds, how the hell did they get all the way up there? And he goes, well, first of all, the previous art teacher didn't have a whole lot of control over the class. And I go, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> And, and, and then he said, no, well, what the kids did, this is the old schools from the, you know, the, the Snyder schools from the early 1900s. So they had those, there's no air conditioning, so the big, long windows. You remember you had those big, long wooden poles that you had to pull the windows down with, right? And so what these kids did is they took the charcoal and they taped with masking tape and they did it like this on the top, like late Matisse. Do you remember those photos of Matisse in the deathbed where he's like doing this stuff? And I go, you know what? If these kids are this creative and this diabolical, then maybe we have a chance. And he goes, and he goes Tim, I really hope so. <laughs> Here we go, first day, all right? And I'm smart. So I come the next day, I bring, I got a boom box, right? I got Treacherous Three, Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bombada, wave if you know what I'm talking about, because this is the explosion of hip hop. There you go. All right, baby girl, I got you. And then I met her at the museum today. You got good people working for you. And, and, <laughs> and, and yeah, and I got that, and I got my paper, and I got everything. And here they go. They said, we're going to give you a master class, which meaning the worst kids in the whole special ed department. All right, so here they come, and boo, the bell went on forever. And here they come, and you hear it down the hallway, boom. Bam, 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 on my big metal door. And I open the door, and four of them are in that photo, by the way. I open the door, and here they come. I have one long table, because I'm smart. And they're like that, and they're like, oh, goodness. And they're like, he's young. <laughs> he's so white, he could get a boom burn. Let's make him cry. <laughs> now, luckily, being in the Ghetto A Day program and having suitable teacher training, <laughs> I knew how to put on the white death mask face. <laughs> that Bernie Getz face, that serial killer face. And they're going, oh, damn, you crazy. <laughs> this is a mess with him. And I said, uh, listen, I hear you're all pretty good artists. You know, uh, da, da, da. I said, we're going to prove it. You have one hour to do one thing. And I took my Xerox paper. That's all I had. Boom, boom. They never see so much paper in their life. Boom, boom, boom. All 12 of them, right? 
And I got the pencils. I brought everything because they didn't have pencils. Uh, and I said, this is what you're going to do in the next hour. You are going to make the best drawing that you have ever made in your life. No pressure. They go, now? My favorite word in the universe. Now. Put on the music. Boom. And they're drawing. They're drawing. They're drawing. I said, keep going. Just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. The whole stack is yours. Keep going. Number one. That's all. Keep going. They're drawing. And I'm, I'm walking by. And I'm looking. And, you know, and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I'm trying to be cool, right? But in my church, we call this shouting material because what they were drawing was blowing my mind. Better than stuff I saw at grad school at SVA, right? I'm like, oh, my God. Ah, uh, 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 I could hardly get the hour evaporated. We're done, and everyone's looking at everybody's saying, and oh my goodness, said how we do. Yeah, this is the best drawing I ever made in my life. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I said, isn't that all right? Beautiful. Give yourselves a hand, and uh, I'll see you maybe tomorrow, but I'm here for two weeks. All right? And then Carlos, who's that little guy in the middle, he goes, before you leave, can we ask you a question? And I go, this is junior high, so right? I said, if it's appropriate. And, <laughs> and, he, and he goes, are you going to stay or are you going to leave like all the rest do? <laughs> Manipulative little so-and-so. <laughs> and I go, well, I'm hemming and hawing. Um, oh, you know, I'm only here for two weeks, and I'm not a licensed teacher, and I don't have all this, and I'm not trying to really get out of this. They have these big eyes like, looking at you. Like, oh, my God. And he goes, I want to ask you another question. I go, what? What? And he goes, would you stay? And it was at, at that moment that I was back in the church pew looking at the Tiffany. These moments don't happen a lot. And I felt this push in my back. And I heard this voice. And it said, say it. And I, 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 say that one word that gets us all. Man, woman, boy, girl. Lovers, haters, whatever. Artists, and especially educators into so much trouble. And that word was, say it. Yes. yes. I said yes. And I said yes. And you know, I hear when you die that your life just passes before you like crazy. And it was just passing before me. Oh my God, what did I do? I said yes. I said yes to these kids. And they go, woo, 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 woo. They're like barking like dogs and going crazy. And I'm like, oh my God. And then uh, I go downstairs. And George is like there, the principal. And he's like this. And he goes, they're good, aren't they? I said, George, they're amazing. <laughs> and he goes, they made you say yes, didn't they? I go, it was a total setup. He had told them to get me to come because they couldn't get another teacher. And so I said, yes. So instead of two years, I spent seven years in that particular school. Now, uh, yeah, every day, 7.30, yep, every, 7.30 to 3. I couldn't stand it anymore after a while. And so with the great, wonderful support of artists like Jenny Holzer, Mike Glear, Kasuth, John Cage, uh, uh, Nancy Spiro, Leon Golub, artists who believed in me, Louis Cruz Asaceta, right? people like that, Rafael Ferrer, who had heard that Tim was doing this crazy ass thing up in the Bronx, as all my friends told me I was out of my mind. And but I, I felt it, I had to do it. It wasn't about duty, I said, I, I said, listen, the next day, they said, you're going to stay? I said, yes, I've decided, but guess what? It's not because I'm a nice guy, all right? I'm not one of these nice, white, gushy, liberal, do-gooder, oh, I'm going to help the universe and all that stuff. I can't stand that crap. I'm, I'm here because I'm angry. You mad at us? Oh, no. Uh-uh. I'm not raging. I'm angry. My hero growing up as a child, to the chagrin of my dad, he was kind of a racist redneck, God bless his soul, but he never understood my unabiding love and idolship of the Martin Luther King Jr. Right? 
who was assassinated at the age of thir my, when I was 13. That was the first real death I ever felt in my life. And in that great essay called Strength to Love, he talks about the fact that there are, um, that the fact that the word anger, there can be a thing called righteous anger. And this, I think this is where most art comes from is a righteous anger where you're not satisfied with the world that has been handed to you. And the word anger comes from the Norse root for the word to grieve. And I grieve that you had, you know, Louis and Nelson and Angel and Robert and Aracelis and Yesenia and Aniel and Richie, I know him today, and Willie Lugo and Jose and Annette and all these wonderful kids and their whole intelligence was totally ignored and put, it, put away. These are kids that hated school but they loved art. So I said we're gonna do something about it. And so what we did is we started our own school after school called the Art and Knowledge Workshop. And ironically, when the bell rang at three, here I go with his ragtag team, here they are. And we would just march five blocks to our space of our own that we got from a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, the little one to match artists. And thank God I love pasta because that's what I ate every day for a year to keep this going. And we worked, here are kids that hated school, were truant, academic at risk, emotionally handicapped, every label on earth, huh? But because we had a system that was telling us what our kids could not do, and I wanted to create an arena in which we would prove what our kids could do, right? And so instead, you know, they'd be there three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine at night. Parents would bring food over. I made them do homework because if you didn't have your homework done, you couldn't get to the art. So that was the incentive. Stick and carrot works like like wonderful, right? And so all of a sudden, work is getting done. IQs are going up. Attendance is going up because you couldn't be there if you couldn't in my workshop if you could not be in school. And we decided that this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a moment like I had in the Knowles Cathedral today. Because it's not a chapel, it's a cathedral to me. And yeah, and the, when you sit there, it's like a good old New England spiritualist seance in which you sit and you get together and the spirits come on down and they talk to you and they whisper in your ear. The great W.B. Du Bois said that I sit beside Shakespeare and he winces not. Shakespeare, Kafka, Shelley, right now, Darwin, Richard Strauss, all these people wrote not just for comparative lit students at Rollins College. God bless your heart, because I love it here. You can tell. They, they, wrote for the, they wrote for my kids. My kids live tragedy, but they live comedy, and they know what this is about, right? So yeah, no, Shakespeare, thank you. And so they come, the voices come on down, and they, let's say, to inspire us. So this, they're the libretto for the opera that we construct. Uh, and we started painting on book pages taken from books that were supposedly too difficult for my kids to read. And here it is. Do you want to see some of the work? Because I'm almost done. All right, then. OK, I'll show you some really early stuff. This is Frankenstein uh, after Mary Shelley. And our process at this point is I just had the paper. We had nothing. But I know how to make something out of nothing, because I'm from me, right? <laughs> Huh? I love it. People say, how'd you get this project going in, in the face of the public school system? And I say, guess what? I'm from Maine. And when you want to build a barn, you do not get a feasibility group together for five years to figure out how to build a barn. You do not study the history of barn building from the year 1600 to 1821, right? You definitely don't go to critical studies and read the book Barn and the Other. You build a goddamn barn. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if your barn is broken, what do you do? Yeah, fix it, all right? So we got all this stuff. Oh, these poor kids, they can't do this, and this, they're dyslexic, and emotionally handicapped, and learning disabled. Oh, my favorite, ADD. Attention Deficit Disorder. Now listen, this exists, but not to the extent it was diagnosed where every one of my kids had Attention Deficit Disorder. Are you kidding me? They can play Grand Theft Auto video games for eight hours straight without taking a bathroom break, and they got Attention Deficit Disorder? You out of your mind. You got TDD, Teacher Deficit Disorder. Can I get a witness? This is why I don't get invited to national teachers' conferences. So, <laughs> so 
So what we did, we had nothing. We had nothing. So we took the pages and we glued them on a grid on some piece of canvas we got. Leon Golub taught us how to put grommets in the canvas. And we had nothing. We had nothing. And we, you know, when you're the art teacher, any public school teachers here, art teachers, they think that everyone in the school thinks that you can do everything with their trash. Right? So they will bring in all their trash. They will bring in the egg cartons. They will bring in those stupid styrofoam peanuts. Like, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? Right? I mean, and, you know, like junk, you know? And Mrs. Heller, who's from the library, brought in these um, library book covers. Remember the old ones, the vinyl ones, where you could eat a steak dinner off that stuff and the book won't get hurt? And they're dusty, they're nasty. Thank you, Mrs. Heller. Thank you so much. But then we figured out what to do. We cut the cellophane off. We got little Sharpie pens. The kids loved them because they smelled funny. Ha <laughs> ha. And, and, yeah, and, so, and we made drawings and we just drew from them. And we took an overhead projector, remember those? An overhead projector on a rolling cart that we had liberated from the burnt out science teacher down the, down the, down the hallway. And he wasn't, he wasn't burnt out because he was never on fire in the first place. And, and so that was easy. And we just took it and rolling them back, yes, 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 no, no, no. That's how we composed them. It's like, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. It's, it's really fun, the composition. And we did these big things. That's, uh, uh, each different drawing is about a different kid. And this is in the permanent collection of the Bronx Museum of Art. That is the second posse that came in after the big posse started. And I want you to sp uh, spend some attention with that little boy right there. But I'm still in deep touch with all those kids. Then we, you know, but the problem with Frankenstein is it was just replicating the negative image of the community. You know, it's, uh, it comes from, historically, right, it comes from the, the German Expressionist tradition, which they really thought, especially during Weimar, and it didn't quite work, did it? But I'm glad they did it anyways, yeah. Is that we show people, the masses, how horrible things are. People are going to get revved up, they're going to be riled up, they're going to organize, they're going to overthrow stuff. But we know now, especially in the 20th century, in the late 20th century, that people just get into it, right? Toni Morrison said it best. You outside people, you just want to see us suffer. You love it. So you can sit home watching this horrible stuff on TV and you just, aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky? And so in doing these crazy, violent images, we were just replicating that. And I'll never forget it. A kid named Raymond. And he sat down and we're doing this. And he said, Tim, it ain't all that bad. Can't we make something beautiful? Oh. Reminds me of that great Dostoevsky quote. When you get right down to it, only beauty can change things. And I think that's why Dostoevsky was one of Reverend Martin Luther King's favorite authors. And I said, wow, the revolutionary power of beauty. Let's go for it. So I was attracted to this crazy book written in the turn of the century by a lonely, depressed, oppressed, persecuted Jewish, a little neurotic insurance clerk who worked all day in a little office in Prague and wrote all night laughing to himself. His name was Franz Kafka. He wrote this book. They called it America. It's really called The Vashtola or The Lost One. It's about a kid named Carl Rosman who wants to get out of his condition in Europe, comes to America where the streets are paved with gold. It's the immigrant dream. And he's totally dejected and rejected. He's about to leave in failure when he is adopted by a utopian commune called the Nature Theater of Oklahoma. And the Nature Theater of Oklahoma has two rules. One, everyone is welcome. Everyone. Everyone, don't matter what you look like, walk like, talk like, act like, eat like, love like. Huh? Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds good. Everyone is welcome. And then the second rule was, everyone's an artist. I said, I like that. That sounds like our workshop. That's not like the art and knowledge workshop. And the kids now call themselves Kids of Survival for $20. It is a wonderful scene in which Carl goes to sign up for the Nature Theater. And there's a scene where there's tons of people playing whatever they want to on long golden horns. And I said, there's something there. It's intuition. There's something there. Let's do these horns. And for months, everyone just did these long golden horns. And I said, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. And, and then I said, let's try it. I know there's something there. There's something there. 
Oh, Tim, come on, Jesus. And I said, no, come on, I think there's something there. Nothing, and then I was watching PBS that night, and just, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? And there was this amazing documentary about jazz, and in the, in the, in the documentary was the great Dizzy Gillespie. All right, yeah, that's right. And Diz had that horn, right, that went up, and I go, that's it. I got, you know, back then, you know, the VHS control, get on the big tape. Next day, I'm walking in, kids, look at this. They play it, they go, ah, that's what you want, right? And I brought all my Miles Davis, my Ornette Coleman, and all the, the, the brass stuff. And they just start drawing like crazy, and they were competing at who could make the most bugged out horn. And then what we did is we accumulated them together. Let's go, ooh, ah, all right? And that's a miracle one. And we made that in my raggedy classroom. I prayed every day that some kid would not have a tantrum and throw cadmium red paint across the room. And it took almost a year to make that first one. And as Anna said, um, we showed it at a group show at Bar Gladstone Gallery. We sold it for $5,000, right? And I brought the check in, and <laughs> Darnell Smith said, damn, white folk will buy anything. Let's make some more. And so, and so we did. And this is America for Thoreau, in which we studied the, 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 the notebooks of Henry David Thoreau and traced them. And we went, they took them, <laughs> I took them for their first nature walk in upstate New York, in Woodstock. They were terrified, <laughs> terrified. Where's the street lights? What's that? What's that? It's a bird. It's a frog. I mean, you know. <laughs> They kept it space, you know, Jason, right, to come out of the woods with a chainsaw and stuff. It was uh, unbelievable. Yeah. And, yeah, and this is a beautiful, beautiful work that's in a private uh, uh, collection, the Rene Collection in Vancouver. And you can see the railroad track, because railroads are really important in my life. My grandfather was caboose conductor at Maine Central Railroad, and when I hear those whistles, oh my God, it's like Johnny Cash, man. I'm just like going back in the time. It's beautiful. This is on the Scarlet Letter by Hawthorne, in which we take the Scarlet Letter A that's supposed to be a stigma, and we take it and make it a transcendent emblem of pride. If you can see very carefully, this was done by the girls in the group. We had several girls in the group, and then it was collaborated with the guys, but they wanted to do something for them. This is on White Alice. This is Alice in Wonderland. It's taken from the original Lewis Carroll drawing. This is a, a, a maquette for their very huge pieces, where she's trapped in that box, and she can't wait to get out. So everything was really great and uh, wonderful. Yeah, this is on uh, Aristophanes, the frogs. And I'm going to tell this story. I'm not going to get into it, but you have to know the story. So we're doing incredibly well, and people love it. I'm out of the school system. I can work full time with KOS. I left group material. As Ina said, we were traveling to Venice and, man, London. And my kids were walking down. They're, now they're 15, 16, and, and Versace and Armani. We're making everyone sick to their stomachs because, you know, young folk from the South Bronx aren't supposed to look like this. And, behave like this and the pride was absolutely mind-blowing and we were good looking too we it was beautiful and uh, <clears throat> it was great this is uh, 1992 uh, just showed from the Carnegie International we were just opening a big show at Mary Boone Gallery and that had uh, opened and that was pretty terrific and we were totally independent we had our own studio no more grants no more this, you know, which I'm Mainer, so we like to pay our own all the way. And, uh, and I thought it was a great example for kids that have been four or five generations on welfare, what you need to do to get it together. It's a mindset, it's not a condition in every case. It's a mindset. We had to break that. And all my kids are in school, things are doing beautiful. Chris Hernandez, that little boy that you saw in the, in the picture, he had just gotten uh, accepted in the High School of Art and Design in New York, and man, we were just so incredibly proud. 1993, he got the news in January. And for a kid from the Bronx, that's like going to Harvard, especially if you want to be an artist. I'm in London, and uh, we're, we're getting ready for a big show at the Hayward Gallery, and at the hotel, I get a phone call. And, um, uh, and I said, well, I'm gonna go out to dinner. And they said, so it was Rick from the workshop. I said, I'll talk to him later. And I went to the dinner, and it was at a Chinese restaurant, I remember. And uh, people had just flown in from New York. And they asked me what I did, and I talked about the South Bronx. They go, oh my god, did you hear about what happened? I go, well, something is always happening in the South Bronx. 
And uh, they go, no, did you hear about the St. Valentine's Day massacre? This was the day after Valentine's Day in 1993. And I go, no. And uh, they said, well, wow, there was a, what, was, what street was that on? Prospect Avenue. Uh huh. And oh yeah, six people were murdered in one apartment. It's all over the news, it's a big thing. It even went national. And I can't, I'm always defending my neighborhood, right? Always. And I, these words actually came out of my mouth and I'll admit it to you. I, and I, I sat there and I was defensive. And I said, well, you know what? If six people were killed in one apartment, probably had something to do with drugs and they probably deserved it. I really said that. It makes me sick into my stomach just to even admit it, but I did. Right. We eat, have a fabulous meal, go back to the Four Seasons, fabulous, right? And I go and the bell is ringing and they said there's an urgent call from Rick. And I call Rick and I go, you know, what's going on? He says, Tim, they got Chris. And I go, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know. High School of Art and Design. They got Chris. No, Chris was murdered. He was in that apartment. Four gunmen. My, my world just, it was like the World Trade Center when you saw it go down. And I said, I'm going to call you right back. I had some drinks. and I, I don't know how long I stared into space. And then I called. I said, did you just call me? Because Tim, yeah, I'm not dreaming. No. And he called me, Bob, Bobby, get home quick. It's crazy over here. I go. I remember vividly that I'm in the airport, an emergency flight out. They have these movies, The uh, Last of the Mohicans. Remember that one? Daniel Day Lewis, and you're five minutes in the movie, and they're slaughtering each other. And I just remember taking the airplane pillow and putting it in my face and trying not to scream my ass off and got to the studio, and there's reporters and newspaper people and camera crews. Everyone is in there, right? And, 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 and Carlos just falls on his feet. That little kid that told me, would you stay? He, so he's now like a young man falling on his knees. Tim, can you believe what happened? I just couldn't believe it. I go, what are all these reporters doing here? And they go, you got to get out of here. This is crazy. What are you doing in here? Because my, my sons are such you know, great gentlemen. They didn't kick them out. You can't kick us out. This is a great story. I said, Christopher was, you know, he was my son. And you should have seen he, the painting that he just worked on from the earth to the moon just went to the Hirshhorn Museum. You should have been here two weeks ago when he was making that. And you, but when it bleeds, it leaves, right? Not in my, not in my house. And get the app out of here. And they boom, 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 and they left, and there was this quiet. And uh, the quiet lasted a real long time. I lost a lot of kids. They left, and they said, hey, we're supposed to be kids of survival? That's bullshit. And I'm going to survive. I'm going to be on the other end of the gun. The nihilism was amazing. Everything we had worked so hard seemed to go down. And I know, I'll be honest, I went down too. I drank myself to sleep every night for almost maybe six months just to get through. <sighs> The, the, the funeral was awful, the, the, the wake, the, then, then going the trial. They finally found the people. It was four gunmen, uh, and Chris happened to be outside his building. They used him as a decoy to get up to get a drug dealer and his family on the sixth floor. They all lived in the same building. The security guard saw the gunmen and ran and abandoned uh, Chris to these guys. So uh, we went through all that. And we were moving the studio. We lost everything, you know. It was 92, the mark, I mean, the 94, the art market totally crashed. Everyone was gone. We lost our studio. We're taking stuff that we can take out. And George, who is Angel's brother and was Chris's best friend, we're going through stuff when we find this pack of drawings based on Aristophanes, the frogs. And Chris was a little... <clears throat> He would listen to the older members, right? And we're discussing, we had big brainstorming things. And he's like, uh, and he would come and go, Tim, look what I thought. And maybe this could be for the frogs. He didn't tell us. He left us behind. I go, that little son, look at him. Look at this beautiful, joyous, transparent, you know. And, and you know, the, the frogs in Aristophanes, they are suffering, but they have joy. It's like brekkekex, coax, coax, coax. We as the swamp children, greeny and tiny, lifting our voices all the time. We, Brekkekex, coax, coax. And 
George goes, guess what? Chris is still here. So what are you talking about? And I will never forget, Chris had a heavy hand and he would draw really heavy. So the lines were embossed in the paper and I slowly traced my finger on the line and we, I said, we gotta step out of this and it's gotta be all about joy. This is on Richard Strauss, Death and Transfiguration. George made that for Chris. And so we looked at texts of survival. This is Harriet Jacobs, Life of a Slave Girl. And these are satin ribbons that stripped all over the entire uh, canvas. This is a canvas that's uh, seven by nine feet that she had to hide in. She was hiding in slavery for seven years. The work really became about a certain sort of beauty of survival. And this has been acquired by the Maine Museum, right? Recently, uh, this is on Huck Finn's uh, Asleep on the Raft. And here we go. And then we got to the Midsummer Night's Dream. So from the 9-11 to, to this. And what is so fascinating is that I asked the kids that you must become Puck. And you know Puck is cool? Puck is the metaphor for all artists. Puck is someone that doesn't necessarily make art to be in beautiful collections, God bless you, or be on the cover of Art Forum, which is really cool, or get, you know, win Emmy Awards for documentaries. I love all that stuff, and I love coming to places like this big time, thank you. But really, Puck changes things just for the joy of it. Puck is a special ed kid in your class. Puck is that thing that makes you do the thing you know you're not supposed to do, but you're gonna do it anyways, right? And worry about it later. So I asked the kids, if you could make a flower that has the power to make you fall in love with the next living thing you see upon awakening from a dream, what would that look like? What would that look like? And they explode into gigantic bouquets of possibility, right? And that's it on a large scale. Um, people say, why'd you do the Midsummer Night's Dream? And I said, because in it, uh, Shakespeare has, I think, the greatest definition of art in the English language. It's the monologue of Theseus told towards the end. Do you want to hear it? And then we'll let you go. It's as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them into shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. See, 200 times a year, especially when you tell fifth graders and they're just, what? <laughs> huh? A local habitation and a name. I'm proud I got a name like Rollins. And I'm proud that you have a habitation like this. And I count it all joy that you had come and share with us tonight. Is that all right? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>